Welcome back. Thank you once again for hanging out with us. This is the one and only IT and the D show episode 452. I'm your host, Bob Walton Spiel, hanging out with co-host producer extraordinaire, Randy Walker. Guest this week, David Williams. He is the CIO and the CISO of Gold Star Financial. This should be an amazing conversation because this is our first, I think, dual role uh, CIO CISO that we've had on the show. So we're going to have a blast. Uh, you can find us online, it in the D.com and do us a favor. Give us a like on the social, subscribe to us everywhere. Fine podcasts are sold. Don't forget for next year, we're filling out the schedule. Uh, we haven't done it yet. Me and Randy still got to go out for drinks to figure it out. Uh, but next year, go to meetup.com slash it in the D. And we're going to, if you got any input on where you want to go, let us know, but we're going to probably be around Royal Oak in Detroit. Uh, for the for the entirety of uh, 2023, I can't believe I'm saying it. I'm already scheduling January bookings. I'm not having fun. <laughs> and just to clarify, that means there is no meetup today, December. What December? 15th. What is today? December 15th. No meetup today, December 15th. If you're listening to this when this episode drops, so see you in January, David. It's end of 2022. Um, how many sales guys are calling you trying to hit quota, man? I gotta, I gotta know that first question. That's, <laughs> oh, that is, a, that is a daily, daily struggle. You know, the, the end of the month, it seems to be every single day <laughs> sales guys. I, I need my stuff. I need my stuff. I need it now. So yeah, always the emergency at the end of the year. I, uh, you know, it's funny. I worked for Cisco. I've been salesperson my whole entire career. Cause that's why it's near and dear to my heart when I bring up that stuff. And uh, they said, if we only get 1% more margin, uh, we will, the company can make like three or $4 billion more. And I said, well, how can we do that? I go, stop doing buy in July. Your customers are all geared up that they know that you will drop your pants. You will give like stupid discounts so you can get your Q4 revenue in and beat the market analysis. And, and so your stock can go up two pennies. I don't, you know, what's uh I got to find out what's uh, the craziest ask that you've been given or what the craziest discount to get something in before end of year. Oh, gosh. I, I wouldn't say we really do discounts. I mean, I'm, so we're in the mortgage space, right? So the craziest ask is really what technology can you give me at no cost to me that's going to change my career today? <laughs> And that's, that, that, you know, it, it baffles me because they, they think it's an ex- extremely simple process of just give me all this tech, give me all this tech, and d- don't charge me a dime for it. You know, our, our model for these branches is they have their own P&L, and they don't want to pay anything for it. They want everything handed to them, and they, they want it all supported. They want it all done right now. Um, so I wouldn't say we have any crazy sales thing uh, in terms of, you know, discounts or whatnot. But my biggest thing is budgeting for the end of the year, budgeting for next year. What tech am I going to bring in next year? I couldn't afford what I got this year with the economy. So it's an interesting point with the, uh, you know, well, first off, I want to talk like how many, I got to ask this because I've asked it. I've had Bressler on here from uh, UWM. I got to ask how many cold oh, yeah. calls, you get, how many cold calls you get in a day? I got to ask. Uh, you know, I changed my office number three times this year. Because I, <laughs> I had it on LinkedIn. That was a big mistake. <laughs> you know, we always get those LinkedIn connect with me now, and it's all just nobody I know. It's all cold call sales calls. And as soon as I accept that, my phone is blown up. But I've changed my office number three times this year, and I've stopped publishing it anywhere. I don't uh, see now. I understand. I understand it, and I don't. Obviously, me being a uh, sympathizer. But I never understood the like the LinkedIn because I get those randos too. Like we've helped companies such as yours, and it's obviously a cut and paste, and you did no homework. I think I've had two people try to get to me that were like, I saw your TED talk, I listened to your episode with so and so in it, and they actually knew, and it went beyond that. It's like I actually really liked the part where you said about the things, and then I go, Yeah, I'll talk to you. But you know, you spent the four minutes. I'll give you, you know, no one else has even come close. Um <laughs> you know, are there people that do their homework or is it really just, is it, is it the cut and paste? Oh, it is absolutely the cut and paste. It is. Uh, I, I've only had I, the ones that kill me too. the cut and paste is at the end. Have you ever had these where they say, I heard that such and such is a great place to check out in Ann Arbor. I'd love to chat about it sometime. Like some random bar that, you know, that they live in Colorado. They don't know anything about Ann Arbor. Michigan, but they'll throw those in there now at the end of the conversation, at the end of the 
you know, the cut and paste. It's freaking hilarious. It's like you don't even, you don't know what you're talking about. My biggest issue is the one where it's saying, I want to talk to you. Here's my calendar. You book a meeting on my calendar. And I'm like, uh, yes. yeah, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to get into the, the dual role thing real quick. Um, yeah. Being a, being a CISO is a big ask. And, and now you're handling both sides. You're handling infrastructure, you're handling systems and software. You're handling security. You know, I don't want to ask you where do you find time in the day, but what, how do you prior? Obviously, yeah, what takes priority? Obviously, uptime next is security. But I guess you tell me what's what's the priority for you in, in any given day? Yeah, yeah, uptime definitely is number one. Uh, system down means no money coming in. Basically, time is money. That old, that old adage, right? So uptime is obviously most important. But you know, we also have a homegrown development department where we develop our own app that interconnects with all of our other apps. So then there is securing that as well, because it's freaking in all of customer data and everything into this. So I got to make sure that that's secured. Um, so it, it's honestly, I don't sleep much at night, uh, but I, I have a great, great team. There, we're about 15 people large in the IT department um, between infrastructure, support, security, uh, and development. And I have a fantastic team that I can rely on. And it's really about building the right team members and trusting them to do the job that I can sleep a little bit better. I mean, I still have the vision over the whole group and lead them, but I have a fantastic team that I can rely on and get the jobs done. Yeah, I was going to say the uptime thing's got to be a big deal. How much you know, you're outsourcing versus how much you insourcing? Because well, you know, when I managed a team and we had you know, for, we had a four or 500 people and we still had a hard time getting three people to stay up all night on patch Tuesdays. Right. How, uh, oh, how gosh. About that? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, patch Tuesdays, we only have about 40 or 50 servers, so it's not terrible. It's not difficult to manage. Um, but we we're servicing about four to five, 450, 500 people is our organization size. And I only have two infrastructure people who are managing our server uh, landscape and two security people. And that seems to be fantastic. It's really not about outsourcing. We have no outsourced um, people. We have a lot of fantastic tools that we have uh, partnered with with certain vendors that ease the the job for our infrastructure and security people. Quick alerts, we have a lot of automations that we use for our in-house development team to help build around. So a lot of power automate stuff we use. I don't know if you want me to mention vendors on here, but I have some that we just automate a lot of. So Rapid7 is one that we use their Insight Connect platform to whenever we see something coming from CrowdStrike, that's our endpoint detection. We can take automations around that that would normally be a person taking some investigations on. We have Mimecast. Any alerts that we come through there, we have Insight Connect to kind of create those flows inspect it all and take action or not take action and create tickets off of it, et cetera. So a lot of the stuff that would have been manual, we've automated so that we don't have two to three guys sitting up at night trying to figure things out. No, it's smart. And uh, you bring up the, you know, the vendor stuff and I got to go back to that, but like, you know, if you ever saw the vendor sheet, the one page or from LinkedIn always shares it with all the security vendors that are on like one page for all the different flavors. And if you go into everything else, there's there's a hundred different flavors. I mean, obviously, you do, do you re- rely on your peer network? Are you reading white papers? Or are you doing a mix? What's uh, what's your you know? Because again, it's it's impossible to choose you know to choose one these days. Um, yeah, how are you going about it? Oh gosh, yeah, it really is. I mean, you get those Gartner reports and everything, and you get the you know the vendors on LinkedIn. We're now best in class, et cetera. Um, but it's really what works best for your organization, right? Um, so it, I've done a lot of white paper stuff and peers mainly. Um, I, I throw it out to the LinkedIn community. Hey, looking to make a vendor switch to this. Uh, I join calls through Sim Detroit. Um, you know, it's great to get out there and networking, understanding how other people are doing it. You know, I know Jason over at UWM. I've had conversations with them. I know people over at Fairway as well. And I'll actually reach out to them and have conversations with other CIOs. Say, hey, this is what I'm going through with this vendor. Here's the struggles. Did you do something similar? What do you use? And they're, you'd be surprised. They're very open to those conversations and helping each other out. And I think that's what's great about what you do, too, is just connecting like-minded individuals to kind of bounce ideas off of each other. 
Yeah. And that, I mean, and that's the thing too, like you're in an interesting space because you're dealing with, you know, anytime you're dealing with personal financial information, social numbers, and in essence, people's lives, because they're, they, you know, to, to apply yeah. for a mortgage, you really, I need to sign over my children's birth certificates. If it does, you know, if I don't pay off on my mortgage, um, you know, you're under just a different ball of stress than just if you guys produce a widget that you sell to a, you know, XYZ Corp. Um, in, I don't want to say talk to me about that, but like that's got to be the number one thing on your mind when you're when you're you know when you're clicking off for the night. Oh my gosh, yes, it is. Honestly, our biggest threat in security is the insider threat. You know, they when people in especially in the mortgage industry, it's all a numbers game. Loan officers want to go to who's going to give them the most money, who's going to give me the best rates, and they're constantly jumping um, companies. The thing is, they want to take their client data with them because their clients are their clients. Well, you can't sure. do that. <laughs> you can't do that. Once I've done a loan with Gold Star, that's Gold Star's client, even though they have that relationship with you, we can't allow you to exfiltrate that data to someone else and then and vice versa. When you come in, I can't allow you to infiltrate data that you've closed with someone else as well. So you see it all over the place. If you pay attention to the mortgage space, there's constantly lawsuits going back and forth between um, mortgage companies suing each other for poaching and exfiltrating data, et cetera. That's my biggest threat is the PII information going out of my system. See, privileged data management is available today and there's a lot of great companies that do it. I'm looking back 10 years and like that wasn't in everybody's vernacular. And and was it just, no. was it just being done and you didn't know or, or, or is it like, you know, are you able to just find out now and you're like, Oh shit, like we just got, we, we've been getting hit for years and now we can finally stop it. Is it, you know, I'm, I'm assuming it's the latter. It, it's the latter. It's still very reactive. It's usually we find out after the fact. I mean, we, we hate to do it, but you know, we jump on separations immediately as soon as we get the resignation. I mean, it's, you're cut off. I don't want to deal with the possibility of anything. Um, yeah, it, it's the latter for sure. Now, are you, did you dive into cloud or are you using sparingly? Cause a lot, I've heard a lot of apprehension just because of the, uh, you know, security in the buckets and things like that. How, you know, what's your stance on hybrid IT? So I'm a big proponent of hybrid IT. So we do, we do have almost most of our stuff in the cloud. I do have a, a one small on-prem data center with just about 20 servers on it for a lot of in-house stuff, you know, basic active directory, um, various other application servers that we have internally, but I'm huge into the cloud. You know, we're in AWS, we're in Azure. Um, our LOS system is hosted in the cloud uh, by Ellie Mae. Uh, so I'm, I'm a huge component of it, but you know, security becomes a huge, huge frame of mind in there. You know, you, you gotta understand how to secure the cloud. I think a lot of people who just get started on this have this false sense of security by saying, hey, everything's in the cloud, I'm set. Like. We, OneDrive, SharePoint, we store a lot of our stuff in there. But, you know, you still need to back that up. That can be ransomware. Microsoft doesn't sure. give you any protection against that stuff. So you you got to make sure you have those layers of protection that doesn't negate your responsibility for securing that data just, just because it lives somewhere else. You know, I have a T-shirt that actually has, it's a, it's a comic book that says, you know, Daddy, what is the cloud? And it's the adult saying Linux servers mainly. Because that's really what it is. It's just a farm of Linux servers sitting out there. My T-shirt says there is no cloud. It's just someone else's computer, and I've worn it. That's and I've worn it to sales thing. calls. Yeah, and I've worn yeah. it to sales calls, and I kind of get the side eye. They know. You know, here's the thing. I'm old enough to. I sold virtual private servers back in the day, and all that was was cloud. It just you know, yeah. As a tra- you know, but but the fact of the matter is, to the things you can do today like far supersede like what you could ever do in the past before it was just compute and store. And now, you know, like literally you can do, you know, a hundred thousand things in, in AWS that, you know, weren't even imaginable five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Within minutes. I mean, I could spin up an, an application right. in the cloud in minutes. Yeah. Unheard of. Now people are just like killing themselves. Cause I mean, I remember like, <laughs> not to, you know, when you get IT guys together, we always talk about back in my day and uh, when we introduced hyper-converged <laughs> infrastructure, the whole big selling point was, oh, the network guy used to call the server guy, the server guy used to call the storage guy, and then and all of it came back. And now you can do it with one person. And I was like, wow, sign me up. Um, but now it's you're looking at it, it's almost gotten, I don't want to say it's gotten more complex, but if you look at now, 
you have your on-prem person, you have your dev person, you have you have to have a cloud security person now. You need someone overarching security, right? I mean, to me, I don't want to say it's gotten more complex. What's your thoughts on like compared to even like ten years ago? Uh, how far like are, have we gotten? You know, the, with more tools come more complexity, or, or is it by, or is it opposite because you're automating? No, I think it's actually become more complex, um, and for a lot of the reasons that you mentioned. You know, you have to have the on-prem guy, you have to have the cloud guy, you have to have the developers that understand how to spin things up, and you have to have the security guys that understand the how to secure those that are constantly, there's more CVE vulnerabilities now than there were 10 years ago. I mean, it's still, it was relatively new last, you know, 10 years ago, but there are more and they're coming out all the time. There's tons of zero day attacks. I think it's more complex. There's a lot more moving parts. It's still the same problem. You still have the, the segmentation of duties, network guy and storage guy and compute guy, et cetera, but we're just changing the vernacular. I think it's more complex it's it's requiring larger teams broader understanding so especially in your industry i don't want to say the brakes have been pulled but wow the brakes have been kind of been pulled on uh you know i guess the market the housing market's still doing strong from what you read but like with the with the interest rates going through the roof um yeah how you know how do you guys plan for kind of like this dip do you are are, are you planning for break pulling or are you like you know, what, what are you guys doing in a time like this when you know it's coming? Um, yeah. What's those, what do those conversations look like? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm relatively new to the mortgage. I'm, I've been here for five years, but what I know of the mortgage industry and I've seen a little bit so far already is it's very cyclical in nature as it is. Uh, rates go up and down, you know, it moves with the economy. There's recessions. You'll notice every time there is a recession, actually interest rates dip and there's then a refi boom, which then spurs another uh, yeah, economic growth. Um, so we, we're very aware that that's how the markets are. It's very cyclical. It's just not a matter of if, but when. No one really planned on this particular one to be as hard as it was. I mean, everyone was anticipating, you know, about a 30% drop off. We're seeing close to 50% drop off in origination. So there's a lot of factors that go into that. I mean, it's It's bad. There's a lot of factors that go into that. You know, we're compressing margins down as much as we can. But, you know, during the last two years, it was, for lack of a better term, all you could eat. Everyone and their brother was refinancing. You know, you get rates at two and a half percent. You're kind of dumb not to do it. Uh, you know, it was everyone was getting a loan. So we took that time to capitalize on the margin to get a nice piggy bank because we knew it was going to drop off. And we're actually taking this downtime to invest back in the company. All that capital that we gained over the last two years, we're investing in newer technology that'll help us scale better. So we did have to, you know, unfortunately lay some people off, but we only laid off maybe 8%, 10%. We've seen mortgage companies completely close up shop. There was actually a report that just came out that said 30% of the loan officers that had licenses in 2021 are no longer in business. They're gone. They've canceled their licenses in the NMLS. They're just gone. It's uh, not going to be one of it's those. Funny. We've, we've planned for this. Sure. It's funny, though, when you look at like your industry and other industries, um, I always look at bartenders as a barometer of economic growth. And there was a boom there for about two and a half, three years where almost 50% of the bartenders that I knew either went to be a real estate agent or went to be an underwriter slash loan, or loan officer. Um, and now they're kind of, now that it's dipped, like, you know, the ones that are doing that were doing well, you know, are staying. And then the other ones are going back to tending bar again. I don't know if you, I, I don't know if you judge it in the same way, but I, I, I think it's a great way to, uh, or at least for me, that was what I saw. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. That's, I hadn't thought about that from bartenders, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're seeing people, I mean, don't get me wrong. Loan officers, underwriters, real estate agents, they can make a lot of money, a lot of money. I'm talking three, four hundred thousand dollars easy. But in markets like this, where they have to do really, really hard work, they're done. They're out. Well, it's not that they're. Uh, it's not the hard work thing. I think it's the book. The they didn't. 
you know, some of the people that have, their predecessors have been working for 15 years in the field and have this, this amazing book. And then, you know, they're trying sure. to just start out. So I think, you know, they, they just ran out, you know, I think it wasn't a, you know, cause they all had the gift of gab, right? Any good bartenders got, can, can talk their way out of a paper bag. It's uh, the ones that have the books, I think are the ones that were able to make it. Yeah. You definitely need to have the book of business for sure. Um, we have a lot, we have a, a program called start team at gold star where we're bringing in green people to the industry and we're teaching them up. They kind of cycle through all of our different departments uh, the sales goes last and we kind of find where they fit best in, in our organization and, you know, culturally, et cetera, and personality wise, but we really wanted them to focus on sales because we want to home grow our sales team. We don't want to bring in, Hey, you've got, you know, all this book of business. A lot of those people, they want to do things their own way. And we like to do things our way. So we, we really focus on the start team and, you know, organically growing the organization how we like to from, you know, roots, grassroots. So let's shift that into IT real quick and how you bring people yeah. in. I'll, uh, I'll tell you how I used to, and I got contradicted once at a conference and uh, it opened up my eyes that I was kind of looking at it through too narrow of a lens. But I, I, my first question was always, talk to me about your last outage. What'd you do? <laughs> and there's no wrong answer. But I wanted to know, did you dive in and not call anyone? Did you call Microsoft or did you assemble a dream team? Right. <laughs> and that told me whether or not you were, you know, because again, I didn't want all one or the other. I wanted a mix. So if like if you assemble the dream team, you got leadership kind of written on you. If you dove in alone, you are, you know, the lone wolf IT. And if you called Microsoft, you might not know what you're doing. Um, even though you might still be good, you're, you're, you know, um, so what, uh, you know, I guess, uh, what's your first question Then I want to dive into the, how I, how else we, uh, looked, looked at other people. You say that one more time. How I looked at other people you said. No, no, no. I said, uh, like what was like, what's your first question or intro question and, and like the box that you put them into, do you do the same thing? Something similar? Yeah. Or? Something similar. Yeah. So actually how I approach this is how do you handle difficult people or, you know, type A personalities? Because I, I want to understand, you know, do they have the thick skin? Because if I'm hiring for support, they're going to get some abrasive people. If I'm hiring for infrastructure, you know, I'll change that up. I actually will ask the outage question as, as well. I like the way you phrase that, you know, did you call Microsoft or you use a dream team? I'm actually might steal that from you. Um, Fine, go ahead. Uh, but what, <laughs> but you know what I really look for in in people is is the attitude and the drive. Is you know, I I don't care so much about you know do I have a bachelor's degree or anything like that. Certifications, yes, I'll look for some certifications because at least that answers the did you call Microsoft question. I mean, certifications will at least tell me that you know some basic knowledge, uh, especially for what I'm looking for. Uh, like if I'm looking for a developer, don't tell me that you know how to code in, you know, .NET Core, but you don't know, you've only done Java. Uh, it, they're, they're completely different. Um, so, you know, I, I really look for attitude and drive because that's what, that's what grows our culture is I want to be here. I want to better myself. I want to better the organization. If you just, you come in at nine, you want, you, you're just there to make a paycheck. You're out at five. I honestly, I don't, I don't need you here. I want you to always continuously improving. That's one of the, the pillars of, of our organization is continuous improvement is how can I always get better? We're always on the latest cutting edge of technology. If we're not improving, we're dying. And that does you don't improve. You don't want to improve unless you have an, a good attitude and a drive. Absolutely. And that was, uh, that always fed into my second question is I wanted to talk, talk to me about your home lab. Um, I wanted a I wanted a geek lifer. I wanted like where the where the lines between your personal and your professional blurred, where you were a hardcore gamer, you built you know home automation on a Raspberry Pi in your basement. You're you know you you're you're something within the nerd culture. And uh, I got my hand slapped pretty hard that like some people you know that they wanted sometimes they just they worked their ass off nine to five and then they completely unplugged and they you know rode their bike and played with their cats. Right. So I'm like, and, and they said, some of my best people are stop at five. And I go, and I kind of opened my eyes to it, but I was on, I was on team U for a while. Um, and, and it kind of just, you know, it, it brought me back to, I wrote a blog called the justice league and I wanted mm -hmm. like, I wanted an Aquaman. I wanted a wonder woman. I wanted a Batman. I wanted a Superman. I didn't want four Supermen because it'd be chaos. So I wanted kind of that diverse 
people that looked at things through different lenses, different angles, had different outlooks on IT. And I knew where yeah. to put them based on how they, based on what they like to do, based on their passions, right? Right. Yeah, it's funny that you said Raspberry Pi, actually. I, I have a Raspberry Pi that I built in a, a home-built arcade system. <laughs> I downloaded a, a whole bunch of uh, old-school ROMs and put it on there. So I have a, a two-person arcade that I built. And a, a lot of my guys, actually, I got them all a Raspberry Pi like two years ago. Let's see what they do with it. <laughs> See, I told you, no, uh, no, but for me, like, again, I, I think that was a, a solid question. So, I mean, we kind of figured out a long time ago that the degree wasn't the thing. Um, yeah. You know what? I guess when you talk about the, when the drive and the, you know, and kind of the personality thing, you know, cause again, it is weird. It's fickle. You have, you have some of the type A's and you have some, uh, you know, you just don't want, with me, it was always I didn't want two puffer, puffer fish in the tank or two uh, the was the beta fish. Sorry, that the attacking the beta fish. I wanted a you know I I didn't mind having a couple on the bottom of the tank feeding off the algae. Um, so like when you talk about like personality, like wh- you know, are you trying to get a mix? Or are you looking you know are you looking for a mix of extrovert introvert? Like you know, obviously you know you know when you talk to them for two minutes what what where they are. Um, how, yeah. what do you look for? I guess in that in that case, I'm a hundred percent with you. I. I want a, a very diverse group. I want introverts. I want extroverts. I want, you know, passive. I want, you know, the go-getters. Um, and I, I want the guys that are just even keeled, et cetera, because you're right. You're going to get a lot of fantastic points of view, different points of view that where someone is weak, the other one's going to be strong. And then collectively as a group, we actually, we use teams at work. Okay. And you can name your team, whatever you want. Ours is called hive mind. Because we collectively think all the same as a group, but we all have differing points of view. And we, we meet every single week. And we also have a group with all of our, all of our team um, every month uh, just talking about ideas. How can we get better? Where are we deficient? You know, and it, I, we just go around the table. Where are you struggling? What are you dealing with? Uh, I go last. And, you know, th- we have a hive mind because we all have these differing points of view. I, men, women. Women are fantastic. Here's one thing I love. In IT, there are not a lot of women's point of views, and they bring a lot to the table. I'm a big proponent for the women in tech. They bring immense value to an IT team. They're very organized. Traditionally, men are not very organized. And, uh, you know, I, I want that diversity because that's what makes a strong group. Well, and plus you learn and you pick up things from people like, you know, me, I got two teenage daughters. I got two teenage daughters right now. And I'm like, I didn't learn this crap till I was in my early thirties. I want to give you guys fast track. You know, my parents were immigrants, you know, speaking English was, it was so, 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 I mean, I, you know, and that's kind of how I am. I, I, I like to mentor either a salesperson or someone like up and coming in tech, at least like one, once a year, or once every you know year and a half, you know, you got to see like, okay, I, you know, you, you'd be great in this. And then just kind of like, push them through the system and give them fast track. I think that's uh, sometimes, you know, we got a leg up, you know, we, with me, it was easy. I was selling beer in college. I put out 10 resumes. I got 10 interview requests to 10 it companies <laughs> and, and and picked one data center that I thought was cool. You know what I mean? You can't do that now. It, it's, it's, you know, no. you kind of got to have that fast track and that leg up. Um, you know, I guess, how do they get in the door in terms of, uh, you know, you, you get a hundred resumes on a, uh, on a job rack. How do you, uh, how do you figure out who's who? Well, it depends on what I'm looking for. If I've got an immediate need for someone that's super experienced for, to fill this project, you know, I'm looking for that. But if I'm looking for a support role, for example, entry level, I'm looking for someone who's not been in IT before. I, I'm looking for someone who's been in customer service. Maybe they worked at Walmart. Maybe they worked at Starbucks as a barista. They've got that face-to-face customer service that they've had to learn. learn. Um, so I'm going to bring them in. I'm going to talk to them and see where their real passion is, you know, is it in technology or is it in just customer service? Because if it's customer service, it's fantastic. I can teach you the technology part of things. And, you know, I'm with you. I, I prefer to mentor people. You know, I got thrown into IT because I love computers as a kid. I, I got my first computer when I was 12. I took it apart when I got home and I ended up getting an IT job when I was 19. I quickly became an infrastructure manager by the age of 21 didn't know what I was doing. I had no one there to teach me. I had to learn as I went. Uh, and I don't want these guys doing that. So I want to be a mentor, be a leader to them. You got the drive. I can teach you the skills. 
Yeah, something could be said though that you that you picked that stuff up and you learned it on your own. I'm just saying, like that's that's probably why you're in the seat that you're in and you're not sitting on the desk still. I'm just saying. Um, but well, you know, that's drive. Me, that that's yeah. that's drive and passion. You know, if you're passionate about it, you're going to put all your effort into making sure you're darn good at it. Yeah, yeah. So you uh, you brought something up pre-show that I, uh, it's near and dear to my heart, and we uh, we've been working with a few organizations that. Uh, you know, recycle old electronics and they retrain people. But you guys are you guys looking at this on a different angle with how you uh, life cycle your tech. Um, talk to me about that because I think you're one of the cooler ideas that I've seen uh, come through here in a while, long time. Yeah, yeah. So what we we found out is, you know, we we had a lot of technology. We cycle every three to four years. We had all these laptops, and you know, we spent about a thousand bucks a piece on them. We're like, what are we going to do with them? We could destroy them, etc. But we don't have any regulation on you know destruction. So I'm like. There's got to be someone that can use this. First, we talked about uh, employees, give it to them. Um, but, you know, dear and dear to my heart is education. I have a sister-in-law who's an educator, and she works at a private school. And she's like, you know, we don't even have technology. We have one laptop per room for these kids to share. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I've got 70 sitting on my shelf that are perfectly fine. I'm like, let me just give them to you. And it kind of started from there. So we've been reaching out to a lot of private schools that, don't have you know the funding for the chromebook one-to-one -one chromebook uh, and we're starting to expand into you know underprivileged areas in detroit as well to even let them take that technology home even if it's not for the school give it to them as a gift for the child to be able to work at home because not a lot of these kids have laptops at home that they can continue doing their schooling on we've got all this technology we're not going to use it let's put it to good use so um, you know, I've had discussions with some people at Sim Detroit about that. I'd like to get other organizations involved as well for their expired tech where they can do that. Give it to me. I'll, I'll make sure it gets in the right hands. But that's something that's near and dear to my heart is making sure that technology is available for everyone. There was a Reddit thread today that was talking about how shocked they were that their roommate didn't have uh, a laptop because their screen broke and they needed to look for a place that did the you break, you fix or whatever. And then it got into this huge thread about how like people in underdeserved areas. Uh, and we've been talking about this for years with Comcast because they had the whole $10 a month program for underprivileged kids, the kids on free lunch programs. Um, and they could buy like a hundred dollar mm -hmm. laptop, but a lot of times they wouldn't take advantage of the hundred dollar laptop because that's a hundred bucks, right? Some, to some people, it's a lot of money. Um, so just, yeah. it's, it's shock, you know, for us, you know, I don't want to say we're in privileged situations, but you know, we have probably five or six or seven computers in our house <laughs> amongst the kids and everybody in, you know, the crappy two ones that sit on the, you know, sit in the basement. Cause I haven't opened them up in four years. You know what I mean? But like right. a lot of homes that a lot of kids that don't have a, like a, just a laptop or a PC and sometimes you got to do work on it. I was trying to do a shutterfly book for my daughter, um, on my phone and I'm like, I gotta go on a PC, you know, on my dual 27 inch monitors, right? Spoiled ass. Um, <laughs> because otherwise I can't get it done. But I mean, it's, it's a big thing. So no hats off for you guys for, for, uh, for doing that with the school kids. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's near and dear to my heart. As much as I can do, I will do. I mean, we have phones, we have iPads, et cetera. Let's get these into the hands of kids that can use them. Sure. Sure. Um, so are you guys hiring at Gold Star or should I point people that way? Or you, you need anybody in the IT department? Are you guys good for now? Uh, we, we actually just took a rec down. We just, uh, we're, we're hiring for a developer. We just, uh, we filled that role. Um, so we're not currently hiring, but we will probably be hiring in early 2023, probably about March or April. Nice. Awesome. Well, David, I can't thank you enough for the time spent. It was, uh, it's always super enlightening to see people's different perspectives on, uh, how they tackle just day to day and how they, uh, stuff, the stuff they're passionate about. So no, I, I sincerely appreciate your time. Yeah. I appreciate it, Bob. And then, uh, yeah, don't, don't hit up David on LinkedIn. Uh, he's got too many requests. Already. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll put out, uh, we'll put all your stuff up on, uh, on, uh, uh, our post show notes, but I uh, thank you again. Uh, we're going to wrap things up for this episode 452 of the IT and the D show on behalf of Bob and Randy. Do us all a favor, drink up your drinks, get your phone numbers. You don't got to go home. You just got to get the hell out of here. See you next week. Drive careful. Beat it.